Hello and welcome to Aussies Abroad, a series dedicated to supporting and connecting Aussies around the globe with inspiring stories from sport, business and entertainment. I'm Jason Bennett. This is part two of our in-depth interview with AFL player turned NFL champion punter Darren Bennett. Now, if you missed part one, I'd recommend you go back and start there to get Darren's full story. You can find the details in the show notes below. And if you prefer listening to the interview in full, just log on to aussiesabroad.tv where you can find links to all our video and audio content, including our library of podcasts, all of which are available wherever you like to get your favourite pods. Anyway, enough from me. Let's get back to the great Darren Bennett. So, Daz, knowing what you know, what are the keys to success to making it as an Aussie heading over to play college football or in the NFL, either as a punter or indeed as a position player? You know, honestly, having, having Google and having the internet now, it's so, so good for young men. They can research where the school is, what part of the country they're in, who the coaches are, what their history is. They can watch video of other Aussies and other guys over playing in college football. So to me, you know, us watching film when I first got here, it was, it was still tape. It was VHS tape. Now, you can watch. I can watch any of the Aussie punters on the internet. I can watch, you know, I can, I can, I can YouTube their videos and see their techniques and their styles and stuff. So, you know, I think that the consistency of just doing it at 80% of your capacity, looking at the techniques that the best guys use and trying to work on it. For me, the biggest thing with kids is stability and flexibility because the AFL game is not, is not conducive to flexibility in your leg swing anymore. And so that's really the biggest thing that I try to work on with these guys. I, I do this bungee stability workout with these guys that came from Mackie Shillstone and Morton Anderson and stuff when I was at Minnesota. And so the guys are starting to embrace that and it's starting to get some decent leg swings going so that their punts are better and they get less frustrated. And so, you know, this generation has a great opportunity to come across, go to college in America, uh, you know, punt a football, um, some of these big colleges that, you know, they're as big as Bendigo. You know, they've got 50,000, 60,000 students. And so once we get rid of this whole COVID deal, you can go back and play in front of 80,000, 90,000 people. And so I think it's a tremendous opportunity for these young men. Uh, I've watched these young guys come through high school, college, and the guys in the pros, and it's definitely a lot of fun, particularly if your AFL career is is, you know, starting on, on the wane or, or whatever. So, you know, we've got some great mentors in Australia that are working with these young guys. And obviously the guys, the guys that have been doing it for a long time over there have sent a lot of guys over. And so, you know, there's a lot of Aussies here having a great experience and not even just playing football. There's, there's guys that I talk to and they've got Aussie tennis players, Aussie soccer players, Aussie golfers, divers. I mean, there's Aussies everywhere that are over having the college experience. I just had a friend text me and say, her daughter's going to a Christian college in San Diego to play basketball. Awesome, that's great, you know? And so I think it's more than just uh, the AFL guys and, and Aussie rules guys coming over. There's, there's Australians having the American college experience in a normal year, not a 2020, but any other year, I think it's true. And your son Thomas has just finished his college experience, but for an Aussie heading over to the US, the college experience is almost a no-lose situation, isn't it? You get an education paid for, you'll have an unbelievable life experience, you'll have a great um, athletic experience. And even if it goes no further than that, you'll come back to Australia with a whole international network of people that will help you with a college degree uh, in your pocket. You, you, you really can't lose. No, and that's honestly one of the things we try and tell guys. I know that you, you hope to play in the NFL and earn money kicking a football. But if you just have that as your goal, 99% of the guys are going to fail. And so what, what you have to do is make this a two-part thing. Come across, maximise your college experience and enjoy what you're doing. And if, if you want to play in the NFL, the NFL scouts will tell you whether you're good enough. But if you're not good enough, you're not going to whine your way into the NFL of, oh, I wish I'd got seen or any of that sort of stuff. If you're good enough, you'll get seen. So I see guys come over with that as their one goal. And then when they don't make it after three or four years, they feel like failures. And I'm like, no, you should have come over, had a great college experience, got an American degree, done all the things that you just said, Jace, have alumni associations and networking things that people have. 
And then if you don't make the NFL and you don't get that opportunity, you come back with a positive experience, American experience, you tell other people about it and hope they do it too. The ones that come over and go, I'm only going to play two years because I just want to go to the NFL, and then they don't, um, I think that they're not really they're not really doing themselves a favour by enjoying their college experience as much as they should. You grew up playing Australian rules football in Perth. Were you always a booming kick? I was actually. I started in Melbourne. I was. I was. A, I played under tens, elevens, and twelves in Melbourne, and then we moved to Perth. I actually played with Darren Mullane in the under tens, which is crazy. Um, and so um, I was. You know, I. I. Uh, <laughs> I don't think there's any footage of it, but I, I was on the winners on ABC when I was playing Little League for South Melbourne because I kicked the goal of the day under a, a Little League and seniors from inside the centre square at Victoria Park and it hit how, the fence. How old were you? 11. 11. So I, I was actually, I was one of the kids on goal of the day, <laughs> South Melbourne versus Collingwood. So you've hit a 60, kicked, you've hit a 60 metre, what was it, a spiral or a drop punt? I think it was a spiral at that time. But uh, um, yeah, that, that was, uh, yeah, Drew Moffat, uh, Drew Moffat. <laughs> I was on, yeah, I was on the winners. This is like 1975 or something. So yes, I've always been, I had a, I have an uncle who lives at Phillip Island who um, went with Barry Round, went down to Melbourne years ago. Uh, and tried out at Carlton. And he had a cannon for a leg, and he really taught me how to kick as a young fella, you know? We used to go out and have a kick around. And so, yeah, I've always had a long a long kick right from when I was very young. But you battled knee injuries through most of your, well, even in your junior career, but certainly through your senior career. And eventually that's kind of what ended it for you. Only 78 games of footy and retired at just 28. Yeah, and... Uh, yeah, Chris Jones was our strength and conditioning coach at Melbourne and Jonesy used to come over to training camps and he really set the seed for me. You know, he's like, look, you know, my, my nickname in Australia is Billy and he's like, Billy, your legs are just not going to carry you another couple of AFL seasons. So what are you going to do? And I said, well, he said, you can still kick like a mule. He goes, why don't you try, you know, the NFL route? And I was like, well, I don't even know how to do it. And he goes, well, I've got some contacts in the States. I'll make a phone call for you. And he did. And I'll be forever grateful to Jonesy for doing it. He, uh, he, he called uh, one of the guys that run, used to run the NFL software for the, for the combine, worked out who was looking for punters, and San Diego just happened to be one of those teams. So, you know, I was super lucky. I was in the right place at the right time. I had other people come over at the same time as me that didn't succeed. Tony Campbell came over from Melbourne with me, uh, and TC never got a tryout, you know, unfortunately. So, uh, you know, a lot of things, a lot of cards fell my way to, to be – you know, in the right place at the right time, but you still have to perform when they ask you to. So I was pretty happy to, to get a chance. And you'd won two tickets to the US in a AFL long kicking competition, didn't you, in 1992? And you used that to go to LA for your honeymoon. And then that was the opportunity to get down to San Diego and meet some people. Correct. And I beat a young Ben Graham in that, con in that kicking contest by about two metres. I'm so glad that I kicked that extra two metres. Sliding doors, because, isn't it? Otherwise, yeah, yeah. So it was, and, and from that day on, Everyone kept saying, when's Ben Graham going to do it? I'm like, he's got an AFL career. He's going to play a long time before he does this. And so, uh, you know, eventually Ben and I had that conversation and he always did want to do it. But, yeah, I was, I was super happy that I kicked that extra two metres to beat Ben in the, over at Campbell High School or Campbell Grammar. You went down to San Diego for the tryout. What were your expectations? Really, honestly, I just wanted to see an NFL locker room and see a stadium and, and uh, you know, see what happened. So... The first day, they literally put me out in the stadium and I punted out of my hand with no snap, uh, 10 punts. And I shanked one and bombed nine 80-metre punts. I've never hit... I don't think after 10 years in the NFL, I could have hit nine punts as good as that. And then, uh, so the next day, they asked me to come back and Price Warren, who was one of our physios at Melbourne, was in San Diego at the time. So he came over the next day and I, uh, I went out after practice and they snapped a long snap to me. And I, I think I've told this story a hundred times, but... The first one was so fast it bounced right off my nose and I shanked the pun and then I, I thought, well, that was the end of that. You know, I'll, I'll be done with that. And then the next one I caught it and I was so angry I punted it into the parking lot outside. So, you know, I sort of got their attention with my leg strength, but my, I was pretty inconsistent. I wasn't even really off three steps at the time. So anyway, they committed to, to bringing me in for practice the following year in 94 and that's where it sort of started from there. So Bobby Beathard, I think, who was the general manager at the time, said, you've got a great leg. If you're serious about this, we'll send you back to Australia with a, a video and some balls and you've got to work on it yourself. 
Yeah, and they said call us after the Super Bowl. So I did. I called them the day. I was working at the CES, which is now Centrelink at, uh, in uh, Oakley. And I, I watched the Super Bowl live on TV and then I called them the next day. Well, I didn't realize that the day after the Super Bowl, everyone's on holidays. They're on vacation. They go on vacation for a month afterwards, you know, just trying to put the season to bed. And I called the next day and they're like, there's no one here. And I'm like, when you get them, call me back. Well, they didn't know how to call me in Australia. So long story short, I hopped on a plane and flew to America and just fronted up. They're like, what are you doing here? You're not supposed to be here for another month. I'm like, well, no one called me back. So I just came over to see what the hell's going on. So luckily for me, Chuck Prefer helped me out and he, he really worked with me a lot for, you know, that six or eight weeks. And I learned probably more than the rest of my career in that first six weeks with him. So, you know, he was terrific. He would come out with his Subway sandwich and he would sit there and eat lunch and watch me punt. So it was a lot, a lot of fun. So, Taz, it was about 18 months from that first tryout to when you actually went back there permanently. So you're at home in Australia with a bag of balls. How did you go about teaching yourself how to punt? Yeah, so um, that year, you know, I was, I was punting with Tony Campbell at the time. Uh, I had a couple of mates of mine, David Ryan and Ray Galea, that at the time, Olympic Park, right where the uh, rugby stadium is now, which is the Batman Tunnel, um, had a, an American football field right there on, at Olympic Park. So we used to go in and punt there a couple of days a week after work and, uh, you know, just kept working on, my, working on my craft. And I had one of the guys would snap to me and then they would relay the footballs back. And, um, you know, it was terrific to be able to have a couple of mates sort of come on the journey with me. And they both come and stayed with me over the years over in San Diego. And then I went back and worked with Chuck Prefer and they, they put me on practice squad that first year. Uh, I thought I'd won the job, but they, my lack of experience, exactly what you said earlier, the conservative attitudes of the coaches, they're like, we're not going to put a guy that's never played the game on, on you know, active roster. So in those days, nowadays, you know, in 2020, they've got 16 guys on the practice squad. But in those days, to put a punter on practice squad when there was only five guys was really an un, unheard of thing. So I basically that year tried to play linebacker, tight end, I held the down marker. I did whatever I could do to stay on that on that roster because I knew how special it was to be on practice squad. And so the next year in the off season, after we'd been to the Super Bowl, they said uh, that NFL Europe was was starting up, and I asked to be able to go over and play because I knew that if I didn't get some game film, they wouldn't let me play the next year. So they uh, they signed me, and then they allocated me to the Amsterdam team because Al Luganbill had coached San Diego State. He knew Bobby Bethard. They could stay and communicate and talk about how I was playing. So that was great experience for me. It's like having a senior college season. You know, I got to play in 10 games and, and uh, sort of break the rough edges off my technique and learn how to do it live in a game, which was invaluable to me because I, I didn't have any college punts. So that was the only way I could really do it. So it was, that gave you 10 games of film that you could go back and show the Chargers? Which they never watched. I think if they'd ever watched it, I might not have won the job the following year, you know. There was, my long snapper was pretty average. He bounced snaps. He snapped it over my head. But it was also the evolution of the drop punt because every time he bounced a snap, I just drop punted the ball, you know. So it was, uh, yeah, so I think, uh, honestly, if I asked Marty Herney and Bobby Bethard nowadays, did you ever watch film from NFL Europe? They're like, no, nah, we didn't need to. It was great. I'm like, all right, that's awesome. Then you, then you came back to San Diego and you had to compete for the job. I did. Yeah, yeah. So Leo Aragus was there the whole off season and he had no idea that there was another punter over in NFL Europe. So I get there for training camp and Leo's the only punter on the roster. He think he's got the job. So he's like, strut not strutting around. Leo was walking around thinking, okay, I'm the punter at the Chargers. And I rocked in and he's like, who are you? I'm like, well, I'm the punter. And he's like, well, I'm the punter. I'm like, okay, now we've got a competition. So, and it was a really good competition that year. Um, we had that a situation where we would trade off and hit punt return. And like I said to you, this the, the drop punt situation where I was hitting drop punts for punt return was after I'd won the job. But there was a there was a day where the sea breeze in San Diego was really ripping hard. And Leo, it was Leo's turn to hit punt return. And he shanked three punts in a row. And everyone was screaming at him. And he turned around to me and he said, Can you finish the set? And I went, sure. And I turned around to myself and I went, you're the punter for San Diego Chargers because there's no way they're keeping this kid. They cut him the next day. And so, you know, that competition was there. Uh, Leo went on and played for a few years at the Raiders and had a really good 
punting career himself. He just had a moment there where he gave up that, that competition. And so I was, you know, eternally grateful for the Chargers for taking a chance on me and, and tried to repay them every day for the next 10 years. How old were you by this stage? Oh, I was 30. That's, that was the funny thing is I think right from about my third or fourth year in the league, people started calling me coach, you know, and I, I remember I was 41 when I finished and I was at Minnesota and I went in, I'd just done a bike workout and I went into the showers and this guy, guy's like, morning coach. And I'm like, you coach me, buddy, I'll slap you, slap your ears. I said, when you're, when you're a rookie, when you're on, when you're on fourth down, Look back 15 yards. That coach is punting. He's like, oh, man, I'm sorry. I'm like, no worries. At that year, I had Morton Anderson. Morton Anderson was 44 and I was 41. So our punter and kicker were both over 40 years of age. So, But these rookie kids had no expectations that two guys that looked like coaches were the punter and kicker. Did the additional maturity and the experience you had in the AFL, playing in front of big crowds, having successes, having failures, was that an advantage to you, do you think, in those difficult situations such as those competition times when your job's on the line? I think so. I think, you know, playing full forward and having a having your opposition guy line up right next to you and having a competitive situation. Oh, yes, I think so. You know, I think it really does help. And I think that's why a lot of the college guys like Aussie Rules guys, because they're, they're athletes. You know, um, we've got a kid right now, Bailey Rice. Uh, that everyone's trying to get him to play tight end as well, you know. And, uh, and, and he's six foot three, 230 pounds, looks like he shouldn't be a punter. And then he punts the ball and, you know, it, it's, it's incredible, you know, to watch. So, you know, Cody Grace. Cody Grace is another guy I work with over at Arkansas State. Cody Grace is on the strength and conditioning uh, squad at Arkansas State now doing, doing his master's degree. But everyone's like, no way this guy's a punter. I mean, Cody's a, you know, he's, he's a real linebacker size. I mean, he's as, he's as big as the linebackers. And then he punts and they're like, oh, my God, this guy's the punter. You know, so... I think they really like the, the athlete side of it and the competition side of, of playing Aussie rules football. They've got competitive athletes at the punting position. Is Bailey Rice Dean Rice's son? He is. Yeah. Yeah. He's and spent he, time on he's secures been, list, played a lot of good footy at Sandringham, but just couldn't quite nail down an AFL career. Had a few injuries. Has some really relaxed power. He's, he's getting up to speed super quick. Uh, we we anticipate that he's probably going to get an offer pretty soon. So, but he's only been going a couple of months. You know, Jai Bond, who's Jai was one of our punters, who you know, Jai. Um, you know, Jai's been coaching him in Melbourne and uh, and doing a terrific job with him. And I can see I can see the incremental improvements in him week to week when I see his film. And I'm like, there's certain guys where you go, this is going to take six months, and then you see someone like Bailey, and you're like, exactly what you said. We'll handle a big crowd. Won't won't be. Uh, affected by pressure and his punting techniques getting really good really quick for you what was it like running out in the nfl for the first time because it was certainly a baptism of fire it was my very first game was the very first game the raiders ever had back in oakland after being in la for all those years so it was it was a baptism of fire they were they were peeing in cups and throwing it on your head they were throwing coins at you when you tried to punt they were doing everything they could because they were so excited to have the raiders back in oakland and I, I sort of came to enjoy that. But my first game, I, I think my get-offs, you know, an average get-off in a game is 1.2 seconds handling time. I think my get-offs were in the 0.8s. I don't think I held that ball at all. So it was, my heart was running so fast and, you know, pumping quickly. And I think I averaged like 44 yards, but along the ground, I don't think I got one ball up in the air for the whole game. So, you know, luckily I got my second game because that the returner never returned turn one of those balls because it was just so bad. What was your first game experience like in the NFL compared to playing in the VFL? Yeah, I mean, it was, to me, so people go, what's, what's the Raiders like? The Raiders are like playing at the old Victoria Park at Collingwood. You know, the crowd's really close. They're right next to the field uh, in the end zones. They literally could lean across and you can hear what they're saying. Uh, it was... To me, you sort of get caught up in the technique of punting. You know, every now and then you'll hear those guys, but really you're trying to be a good holder for the field goal kicker. You're trying to be a good holder for the long snapper. You're trying to get the ball off and punt the ball where you're supposed to because you've got 10 guys that have given up their bodies in front of you to protect for you. So, you know, you really get caught up in the technique of the game and, and how you maintain that health, fitness and flexibility 
for five, six hours from the time you warm up to the end of the game is the, was, was something that I really enjoyed sort of developing that, that system of doing. Your first two or three weeks were a little bit shaky. You were just sort of finding your feet, which is totally understandable. How long did it take you before you actually felt like you belonged in the NFL? Uh, I made a tackle in week five and I still didn't know what the hell I was doing. Um, I, I felt like probably year three, I felt like I, I earned the right to say I was an NFL player. And I'd also earned the right to not be called an Australian. I really, you know, what I wanted to be was a good NFL punter that happened to come from Australia. I didn't want to be that sort of sideshow Aussie, Crocodile, Dundee, everyone asked that same question, which you, you would have known, Jace, when you were over here as well. Um, you know, I had a guy today, a plumber asked me if I knew Crocodile Dundee, and I'm like, it's not a real person, dude, but okay. Um, <laughs> to say yes, so, so much yeah. easier to say yes, yeah, no, sure. No, what I say now is I've got a couple of mates in Australia that sort of acted like him, you know, yeah. just to try and shut the conversation down. But anyway, so um, you, I felt like I'd earned my spot in year three. And I'd already been to the Pro Bowl in year one. I felt like I didn't deserve to be at the Pro Bowl year one. Year two, I sort of backed it up and punted better. And then year three, I felt like I think I probably miss hit three punts in year three. You know, out of 79 punts, I had 76 that I thought I'd done a serviceable job at. But like you said before with the pressure thing, you never really feel comfortable. So it was, it was one of those things you sort of were on self-preservation every day for 11 years. We joke about the Crocodile Dundee thing, but you actually were called the Crocodile Dundee of the NFL in, a, in an time. article. And, it was, and even the media started calling it because, as you said, you laid the big hit. You're a bit of a novelty. You're an oddity. And on top of all of that, you're actually really good. So you, you, uh, you, you, uh, you became... Uh, you, you, you ended up on the national radar pretty quickly, didn't you? Yeah, it was funny. Uh, you know, towards the end of my career, I was, I, the last couple of years, I was sort of down towards the bottom. But... In the top, in the first eight years, I was in the top sort of five punters in the league. And then we had Ben and Sav, and they were in the top five. And then Matt McBride was the best punter in the NFL for three or four years. And no one even knows about Matt because he didn't play in the AFL. So we had four Aussies in the NFL, and all four were in the top ten. That, that's pretty impressive. And now the same thing's happening with Michael Dixon, uh, Mitch Wisnowski, Cam Johnson. See, honestly, I think Cam Johnson's the best, the best Aussie punter in the NFL right now because he punts in Philadelphia, which is really hard to punt him. Uh, I felt for Jordan Berry when Jordan got cut. Pittsburgh's a hard place to punt as well. You know? And so those guys, people don't understand uh, how, how much that wind really whips off and it's blustery and, and then it's cold and they get that you know, minus five degrees in the middle of December. Uh, those guys, when you punt a whole season in New York, or you, well, you know, we did, we did that Super Bowl, uh, Super Bowl special in New York. How cold the, was that, mate? The coldest I've ever been in my life. Remember? I know, and there's people playing in that there. weather. Oh, mate, remember we stood out there and we were recording all those hostings and we had to keep changing the person that was holding up our teleprompter, our auto cue. We had to keep changing. Vanessa's finger was freezing because she couldn't wife, do the teleprompter. My wife was doing it. We had to go get a couple of the other production assistants and they had to keep rotating every 10 minutes because you had to have, you couldn't have gloves on to do the teleprompter. And they kept Yeah, that's right. Premier. So that whole part of the Northeast, that's how cold it gets in winter. And then these guys punt in that. So I tip my hat to them because I was in San Diego and then I was in Minnesota, which is really cold, but they play in a dome. So, you know, for me, uh, you know, I had a terrific experience, but those guys there, you know, to have those guys be elite at what they do in horrible weather like that, you know, I think that it's tremendous to watch. And uh, I really, you know, I live vicariously through them watching them now. But I watch, I watch Cam punt in Philadelphia and go, mate, I tip my hat to you because you're pretty good. Despite only playing the second half of the decade, you were awarded the NFL's punter of the 90s, which is an unbelievable honour. What did that mean to you? Nothing. Nothing, really. I mean, you know, you're still on self-preservation. One of the conversations we had was, you know, you're the punter of the decade of the 90s, but you can still get cut next week. So what does, it, really, what, did, what does it mean to you now that you don't have that pressure hanging over your head? Um, it's a nice thing. I mean, I was on the All Madden team too, which was I thought was hilarious. I, I replaced the Budweiser horse as the special teams player on the Madden team, the All Madden <laughs> team in like 97. Um, you know, those sort of accolades, there's 11 guys that are getting punched in the face in front of you so I can hold a football and punt it. And so really it's those guys. 
you know, it's my long snapper, David Bin, who did not give me a bad snap in 10 years. That, that, those sort of guys. And so I get the, I get the accolade for it, which really, it's, there's not a lot of fanfare to that sort of stuff. They just sort of tap you on the shoulder and go, you're the guy. Uh, so it's nice to be known as that, but really, does it mean anything? No, it doesn't mean anything. What about being the first player that the fans ever inducted into the San Diego Chargers Hall of Fame? What does that mean to you? Yeah, that's a, I, I'm, look, honestly, I think that was tremendous. It, it's San Diego, even though we live in Tulsa, Oklahoma right now, San Diego is our home, always will be. And, and the people of San Diego embraced us more than anything. You know, having people walking through the parking lot to go into the stadium, having people just race up and talk, talk to you and, and say, thank you, it's great to have you here. You know, the fans were tremendous. And so to have them vote me in, Oh, I'll take that over everything else. I mean, it was, you know, that was an acknowledgement that we'd done a lot of things in the community. We were, we were good at what we did on the field. You know, and I say we, because Rosemary and I are a team. And, and, uh, and they recognised that, you know, to have a punter go up in the ring of honour. I think I was the, only the third or fourth out of any team in the NFL to have a punter in their ring of honour. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, extremely proud to be asked to do that. It was great. Where does the passion come from for you, Darren? You've done everything there is to do in the game. You've, you could very comfortably sit back, put your feet up and go, well, you know, I've done my bit, but you're still so passionate. You're so generous with your time. You're so determined to help other people, particularly Aussies, but not just Aussies, come through and achieve their dreams. Where does that passion come from? I had really good mentors right from the time I started at East Romano. Um, You know, I had... Uh, Harry Neesham and, and Ron Alexander and Tom Hodges and all those guys. And they really taught me to pass it on. You know, you, when you have such a great experience, they passed on their knowledge to me. And so, you know, the last year at Melbourne Footy Club, a lot of us went back, obviously, because we're at the end of our careers, but we went back into the reserves and we played with David Neitz and David Schwartz and all those guys that became the future of the Melbourne Footy Club because we were passing on our experience to those guys. And so my last season at San Diego, they drafted Mike Cyprus and, and I went into my exit meeting with Marty Schottenheimer and I said, listen, Marty, thank you very much for having me. Uh, your punting job is taken care of for the next 10 years. We've given Mike everything we can possibly give him. It's time for me to go. And he's like, I've never had someone be so honest in an exit meeting. And I'm like, well, we wanted to make sure that that punting job was taken care of. So Steve Christie and I really sort of schooled him up that year and it's such a great thing to pass your knowledge on. And then you sort of live vicariously through him. And so, you know, I felt like we had such an experience and this has been a life changing experience for us to come over and do this, that if someone comes over and, and wants to find out why, and I'm chatting to you, Jace, for the same reason, you know, to pass some of this knowledge on. But years ago, when, when uh, Pro Kick first started, they had a kid in Arizona who had a scholarship, got, got homesick and went home, gave up his scholarship. And at the time, Ben and Matt and Sav and I really took it personally that someone would give this opportunity up and go home. And so we sort of all committed to if anyone wants to know what to do and, and how to do it, or if they just need a beer, they need a lamb chop or you know, Rosemary cooks the best desserts you've ever seen, then we would be obliged to help them do that. So we've sort of ended up being a base for all the Aussie kids and, like you said, and Americans that, that want to learn how to punt. Uh, they want to make will. They want to hang out with us and use us as an, Auss as a, an Aussie base here in America. So we're only too happy to do it. We love seeing these guys and watching them progress and develop. Let's talk about your pinch me moment, Daz. What's your pinch me moment in the NFL where you just stood there and went, oh, my goodness, this is, this is real? Super Bowl, uh, and, and unfortunately, it happened in my first year. So, Rosemary and I, I'm on practice squad. Uh, I'm in civvies. I'm not, in, I'm not suited up, but I'm on the sideline for the kickoff of the Super Bowl, and I, we were on the sideline. And years later, Stan Humphreys, um, who was our quarterback at the time, started like a children's ward at uh, San Diego Children's Hospital, and there was a panoramic photo of the sideline of the Chargers on the sideline, and there's me standing in my jeans and my Chargers shirt on the sideline at the Super Bowl. So that was my pinch me moment to start, you know, going, what the, five months ago, 
I was working at the CES, you know, and and I'm standing on the sideline of the Super Bowl on the team that's playing, and we got smacked by the 49ers. But that was for me. That was my pinch me moment. And then my second pinch me moment was walking on the field, my first punt at the Pro Bowl, going, "What the fuck am I doing here?" You know, I, I mean, I was like. I'm looking at the legends of the game and the, and all at the time in Hawaii, all the legends of the legends of the game came to that game, you know, because they all wanted a week in Hawaii. They would all do autograph sessions and stuff. And I'm looking at the legends of the game and I'm on the field with them and I'm going, this is crazy. I really is. Remember the story you told me about Brock Lesnar, which I thought oh, was yeah. absolutely hilarious. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, you've got, a bunch, so you've, got, you've, got a, you've got a bunch of great stories. I'd love to just get some of them on tape. So it's funny, Nate Burleson, who's going on to a great media career right now. I think he works for like extra, extra or like not extra sports, extra or one of those entertainment tonights or whatever, but he was on NFL Network. And he told the same story and it was, we were scrimmaging against Kansas City at Mankato when I was at Minnesota and Brock Lesnar was trying to make the team. And I really thought they tried to make him a nose tackle, which he was undersized for. If they'd made him a defensive end, I think he would have made the team. And they, they made him run down on a kickoff, but didn't tell him how to do it. So he ran down and got smashed by the wedge in those days. And they went, oh, he's soft. And, and I'm like, he's absolutely not soft. He was, if he was our defensive end, he would have beaten out our starting defensive end. He was so fast and athletic. He did an inside backward double somersault off a diving board in the, in the gym. And we're like, that's a 275 pound man doing back, back flip. So we go out and, and all of a sudden, um, Mike Rosenthal, one of our offensive linemen, signals to the sideline and Dante Culpepper, sorry, Mike Rosenthal was underneath the other team's bench getting beaten up in a, in a fight during the scrimmage. And Dante Culpepper, our quarterback, was in the middle of the field and he signaled to everyone, hey, come and help Rosie. And as we started to go, one of the guys hit Dante Culpepper. And as soon as you touch the quarterback, it's over. So we empty the sideline. And as I'm running across... I've got, I watched this pair of white cleats go up in the air like this. I'm like, what the hell was that? And I didn't even think about it. And I went over and Dante Hall was one of the best punt returners in the league. He's standing there with no helmet on. He's got his helmet in his hand and there's haymakers going all over the place. And I'm like, Dante, put your helmet on. He's like, oh, thanks, mate. Sorry. Puts his helmet on. And we're trying to just stay away from the biggest, strongest men you've ever seen in a full out, like blazing saddle size, size melee, right? So then we go back afterwards, everything settles down and all the boys are talking about this Brock Lesnar thing. And we're like, what? And they're like, no, you've got to see it on film. So the next day, Mike Tice shows it. And what happens is when our two's defense was going against the one Kansas City offense and when Pep gets hit, they all turn to run and the, the starting center for the Chiefs thinks he's going to get a cheap shot in on Brock Lesnar and he belts him. And Lesnar turns over, leans over the top of him, grabs his belt and suplexes a 300-pound man. And he must have shown it 25 times. It was the greatest thing I've ever seen. And so I'm like, Lesnar's going to make the team right here. Well, I'm glad he didn't because he made so much more money out of MMA and all sorts of stuff. But single, one of the single best athletes I've ever seen who'd never played football since high school. And I felt like the head coach made it a bit of a publicity stunt but he was serious about making that football team. And I think if they'd changed his position, he would have played in the NFL. So those white cleats were owned by a bloke who was 300 pounds sailing through the air. But he was a, he was an all-pro centre. Like, he knew what he was doing, and there's no way he wanted to do what Lesnar made him do. But he flipped him and suplexed the guy, and it was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. Daz, very early on, you caught plenty of media attention for actually laying a hit, which is something that punters just don't do. Yeah, and it, and look, my first first uh, preseason game against the Rams, I was running down way too close to the line of scrimmage, and the guy, the coach is like, you, "You've got to be an aggressive safety, but don't be down there with everybody else." And I was still in Aussie rule shape a bit, so I could run. And so he backed me out and said, "Look, you've got to. It's like a triangle. You've got to be the back of the triangle. You're the last line of defence." So then against Pittsburgh, like week five, I hit this punt and I out and kicked my coverage. It was two, it was a 64-yard punt or something. It was a great punt. But I look up and I was, I'd softened off. I still wasn't sure what an aggressive safety was supposed to be. So I left way too much gap in the hole and I look up and I'm face-to-face with the returner. So I tried to speed into the hole and 
he thought he was going to get round me and I just plowed in it. But it was zero technique. I mean, I just, it was, it was an accidental collision in, into the returner, but it sort of people, you know, talked about it afterwards. So I, I was glad I made the tackle on Andre Hastings, but I had no idea what I was doing. And you copped a bit of punishment from that at yourself, didn't you? Didn't you bend a plate in your arm that you had to have a replace at the end of the season? I did. I broke my arm in the last year at Melbourne and I had a plate in my forearm. And uh, for every snap I caught the rest of the season, I could feel a ligament flick across one of the bolts on the, uh, on the plate because I bent the plate. So I had an ankle surgery in the off-season. They took the plate out at the same time. But I can still, I can still feel where those bolts were. So no wonder you knocked the bloke senseless. You whacked him with your plate. I belted him with a plate, yeah. <laughs> Tell us about a couple more of your most memorable moments, whether they're the craziest or the, uh, or just for whatever reason, memorable, funny, serious, scary. Yeah. So I think I've told you this story, Jace, but I'll tell it again. So we talk about the Raiders, you know, and so the Raiders would fire you up and they would go deep into the media guide and they'd be talking about, oh, you know where Rosemary is? I know where she is. And they taught, they'd, they'd go through your kids' names and they'd tell you, you know, your high school was horrible or whatever. And so the Raiders fans were just deep. They were, they were really parochial Raiders fans and they would do anything to put you off. So we had a game where we punted 27 times. And Leo Aragus, who I talked about before, he was the punter at the Raiders. Leo had 16 punts and I had 11. It was it's still the NFL record for the most punts in a game. And we, we lost seven to six because they, they had 53 yards of offense and threw an 80-yard touchdown with like 10 seconds to go and beat a 76. Anyway, one of the punts, I'm punting in front of the black hole. And when you get, we were on the, like the three-yard line. When you get there in front of the black hole, the crowd is literally two meters behind you. And so you can hear them. Well, they, I didn't need to hear them. They were flicking coins at me and I could hear them bouncing off the back of my helmet while I'm waiting for the snap. So I catch the snap. I hit a 65-yard bomb out of the end zone. And I turn around, I flip double birds at these guys and cover the punt. But I looked down as I did it, and there must have been two bucks in change sitting at the, at the right where I was standing. They'd been bouncing with a frisbee in these quarters at me and bouncing them off the back of my head. So when you do that, that sort of stuff, you know, just sticks in your mind as you're like, Man, that was, I love playing at the Raiders. It was fun. I always punted pretty well at the Raiders because they they buy you up so much. Who was the best player you ever saw? Uh, best player I ever played with was Junior Sayer. I mean, it's so sad that he's not here anymore. And and obviously, you know, with with Danny Frawley's family talking about CTE, that the same thing happened with that with uh, Junior and and uh, to watch a man at two hundred and sixty five pounds, three percent body fat move as fast and as athletically as Junior Seau did, I'd never seen an athlete like that in my life. And so, you know, the fact that he even knew who I was and talked to me and he, he, he called me an Islander from the day, first day I got there. Uh, and I said, well, I'm not, I'm not from the island. He goes, mate, you're from the big island. And I'm like, okay, I'll take that. Junior even knows who I am. But Junior was the all everything at the Chargers. He was local San Diego boy, went to USC, came back and played for his local football team. And it was the first time I'd really met a superstar, you know, and he was, he was tremendous and played 18 years in the NFL. And, and in hindsight, look back, probably shouldn't have played as many years at linebacker as he did. It affected him long term. But, you know, such probably the best football player I'd, I'd ever, ever, best athlete I'd ever seen. Weights, the weights that he lifted and how often he did it. And he would lift at 4.30 in the morning. And then the Chargers lift at nine o'clock would be his secondary lift for the day and he would lift with all these uh, New York power lifters in San Diego. I'd never seen an athlete like him. He's unbelievable. So Daz, compared to when you first jumped on the plane and headed over to the US in your late 20s to have a, a crack at a second career, how's the journey met your expectations? I mean, my American journey, I look, honestly, the time in the NFL, it, I look back fondly and, and realise that, you know, it was terrific that my kids got to see me play at the end, you know, playing till I was 41. The boys were only five and six when I retired, but, you know, they remember me playing. Uh, they don't remember this body nowadays at 55, as messed up as it is, playing all those years, all the AFL years and the NFL years. Um, they sort of laugh, and, and it's probably a distant memory now that they think that I could possibly have ever played in the NFL. 
But that was one of the great things is to have these two young American boys who are Australian Americans living here in the United States and to see me play, I thought was a lot of fun. What advice would you give to, to young Aussies in any field, whether it's sport or business or science or the arts, that are thinking about, oh, you know, do I take the big plunge and leave my family and friends behind and head overseas to chase my dream? There was a great book years ago that I read called Away Game. And it was written by, I think, the guy who ran, who owned, uh, uh, was the CEO of WD-40. And that, how Australians achieve uh, above their, above, they punch above their weight worldwide. There's a lot of Australian CEOs that are CEOs of worldwide companies. And I think it's part of our adventurous spirit. You know, being, being from an isolated island in, in the South Pacific, we take chances. And I think we are one of the cultures that are universally liked worldwide. There's not a lot of people that say anything bad about Australians. They like our laid back attitude. They like our honesty to, uh, to all sorts of things. Sometimes they dislike our honesty because we're a little too honest when they want us to be a bit politically correct. But I think that allows Australian, and the way that we have our supportive society in Australia, it gives us a safety net to go and say, let's jump off a cliff and if I break my leg, someone will fix it, you know? And so I think that makes Australians adventurous. So if someone has a dream to do something, I would absolutely tell them to go do it. And, and 2020 is not going to happen again. So all the restrictions that we have, eventually we'll find a cure or get some sort of vaccine for this thing and it'll be over and, and we'll be able to travel worldwide again. But absolutely travel absolutely chase your dream and 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 uh if you ever see that book the it's called away game it was a terrific book it was about aussies that are, are overachieved around the around the world it was a great read it really gave me a lot of motivation to go you know help do what we did do you miss australia i do uh i haven't been home since 2009 now and uh i do i miss you know my uncle who taught me how to kick um, I fish with him all the time. My brother's across in Perth. My mum lives in Pakenham there in Melbourne. Uh, Rosemary's, Rosemary's family, Rosemary's mum lives in Bendigo and her brother still works on the farm. So, you know, you, you know our situation and why we haven't been home for 10 years. And so I do. And, and it's funny, I was saying to someone today, one of the guys that I work with building the house, I've never, I've never missed Australia. I know that it's always there. And, and our future was in America. And so we've developed and forged our life over here, but knowing that Australia's there. To have the coronavirus and have Australia not be there and not be able to get on a plane and go home to Australia and, and just do it like we could, which we never did. We never went home for the last 10 years. But now that we physically can't, it's the first time I've sort of missed, really missed Australia, where, you know... We've got Lachlan Edwards here, uh, Lachlan Wilson here, who's punting at TU, took over from Thomas. He's from Melbourne, great young kid, but it's, it's almost like having another son here. He talks to his parents back in, in Melbourne all the time. And so that sort of helped us a lot, having a coffee with him every now and then and, and, and having that connection. And, and I talk to Dwayne Armstrong in Melbourne all the time and, you know, and, and being able to Zoom with people and talk to people in Melbourne sort of makes you feel closer to home. But it's the first time in nearly 30 years that I've really missed being in Australia. And I guess it goes both ways, doesn't it? People come, kids come from all over America to come and stay with you, but that also helps with your Aussie connection. You get something out of it as well because you feel like it's a little piece of home. Absolutely, we do, yes. And, and when they feel like they have a break but there's not enough time to fly home to Australia and it's expensive to do that, they can come and hang with us and they can have a pun and we can go fishing and we can, you know, cook a barbie and do all that sort of stuff and just have them feel a little more relaxed and comfortable about being here. Particularly this year. I've done a lot of, I've done a lot of mental health calls this year. Like, hey, are you going right? How are you doing? Because there's a lot of young men over here that, first of all, not playing. Some of the teams, there's guys that have come all the way from Australia to punt for their football teams and the team's not playing. You know, a lot of teams have been shut down, you know. And so just making sure that the boys are okay over here, that they're, they're doing all right and, and know that there's, there's, you know, someone over here that understands what they're going through and, and uh, you know, they can't come and see me, 
But at least we can talk to each other over the phone. As you mentioned, you haven't been able to come back to Australia for 10 years. Why is that? Well, my older son, Will, has muscular dystrophy. And, and as things have progressed, we've sort of, we drive around the country here. We, we travel around America in an RV and we, we tow his wheelchair van behind us. But, you know, he said to me the other day, he goes, I could fly home. And I'm like, I don't think you could. So, you know, it's, it's just one of those things going through what we do as a family. Um, you know, flying, flying to Australia is not an option and it takes two of us to look after him. So leaving each other, you know, for the extended period. I've still got furniture in storage in Moorabbin. It's imagine, been there for 10 years. Imagine what you've spent on that. <laughs> I have paid for that furniture three times over with my storage fees. Our friend, our friend Yvonne O'Toole in Melbourne takes care of it and pays the, you know, she, she uses my bank account and pays for the storage every month. But if people in Melbourne must be loving us because they, they're like, what the hell's in that container? But it's been there a long time. So must eventually be, we'll get home. And, must and be pretty special. Out. Must be pretty special furniture, Daz. Oh, it's all my fishing rods and all that crazy stuff. That you go, I could have sold that. I could have put it on, on Gumtree years ago and sold it and not even worried about it, but it's still sitting there. So, What pieces of Australia do you guys have and keep with you to remind you of home? We have a lot of Australian art. Uh, I have a couple of didgeridoos. You know, I, I listen to a lot of Australian music. I've got, I've got a photo up here of the Brighton bathing boxes. Um, you know, we're building a very Australian house next door. People will keep looking at it like, what the hell is this house? And I'm like, well, in Australia, we do commercial, residential, mixed architecture with modern, you know. So we're building, we're building one of those houses next door, which people sort of, Half the people go, this is really cool. And the other people stop and scratch their head and go, geez, what is this? So, you know, we try and do that and then talk to the Aussie kids, you know, that's having these Australians really keeps us grounded with, a, with an Australian um, accent and people are like, oh, you still got an Aussie accent. I'm like, if you knew how many Australians stayed with us, I speak to Australians more than I speak to Americans. So, you know, it keeps us grounded and it keeps us attached to Australia, which is great. If your doorbell was to ring right now and a care package arrived from Australia, what three or four things would you want in that care package? I'm a polywaffle fan, which I'm not even sure they sell polywaffles in Australia anymore. So uh, Will, Will loves Milo. So he's, he, if anyone ever comes and visits, like, what do you do? Milo. Uh, I'm a pro-mite guy, not a Vegemite guy. So pro-mite. Pro -mite. Wow, that's a niche yeah, market. so... It is a niche market, but it came from Western Australia. My girlfriend at the time, her family ate Promite and I actually started to like it. So I'm a, a yeah, Promite, Vegemite, a Promite, Milo and a Polywaffle would be the three things I'd want the most of. And if you could have a, a dream Aussie barbecue where you could have three or four Aussies, past or present, living or dead, drop by for a beer and a lamb chop and sit around and chew the fat and talk all night, who would you invite? Fortunately, I've had one which is awesome. Uh, I, I, would love to, I would love to meet and chat to Don Bradman. I think that'd be, he'd be an awesome conversation. I've had a beer with Rod Laver, who lives in San Diego and uh, is such a legend and, and bump into him every now and then, like Home Depot in Carlsbad when we were there in San Diego. Rod's such a generous man. And, and uh, I've got a couple of friends who are good mates of his that play tennis with him and Jay Paris, who's one of the beat writers at the Chargers, is one of his best friends. And, and you know, it's so funny. I'll be sitting having a coffee at Cardiff and Jay Paris would be like, where are you? And I'm like, I'm at Starbucks in Cardiff. And he goes, I know. And I turn around and Rod Laver would be there. And so he would sit and have a coffee. And, and so Rod would be one of those people. And then Sir Robert Menzies, just because I would love to know the politics of Australia uh, years ago. Um, and then I would add a fourth one. I'd add Banjo Patterson in because I just think, you know, the, 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 the personality of Australia is he, he hit it right on the head with a lot of his poetry. And so those guys together, I think I could just sit back with my hands behind my head and, and listen to those guys talk about the history of Australia and it'd be awesome. Darren, thanks so much for your time. It's been fantastic to catch up again. Congratulations and thank you for everything you've done for so many Aussies that have come through no over worries. the journey and best of luck for the road ahead. Good on you, Jace. Good to chat to you, mate. Darren Bennett, fantastic punter, even better human being. And if you talk to any of the guys he's helped along the way, they'll all talk about the amazing influence that Darren's had, not only on their careers, but also their lives. 
Well, that's it for this Aussies Abroad special feature. Thanks for joining us. And if you enjoyed the show, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just log on to aussiesabroad.tv where you'll find the links to all our social media. I'm Jason Bennett. We'll catch you next time on Aussies Abroad. Thank you.